You can go live, huh? Yep. <clears throat> All right. Well, this evening we're going to talk a little bit about um, some forage quality and availability and really kind of put that against cow requirements. And so one of the reasons is we put our topics together um, for this series of meetings that we were kind of thinking as an extension specialist group, we asked for some feedback, um, was a little bit on this issue of environmental stressors. And I think one of the big ones we've kind of seen, what was the weather like up here in, let's say, last spring of 2018? What was it in Hayes, Kansas, Dr. Jaeger? Dry, right? I was doing drought meetings in, all over the state, or starting to. So was Sandy. So how did we end 2018? What did the growing season of 2018 turn out like? A little bit wet. Yeah, that's pretty interesting to go from when we were turning out cows, we were worried about not having enough forage because it was dry. We ended up in the grazing season actually having probably what I'd say pretty close to average or above average precipitation. And then in the year on, we're all battling mud. And now the winter that just doesn't seem to want to let spring kind of happen. So we got a fair bit of weather variation. And I think for most cattle, this is probably what tends to drive this forage quality versus availability. And maybe this is kind of my classic fence line comparison. So on the right, your left hand side, you know, there's not much forage. You can see pretty big gaps between bunches of grass out there. And obviously this isn't Kansas with the mountains in the background, but there is a little bit of green forage there. It's probably pretty high quality, but we don't have a lot of it. Look on the other side, there's a lot more forage there. Maybe a little more dormant stuff that's still standing. Um, both of them probably a little less forage than what you're used to seeing here. But it's this issue of forage quality versus availability. And so as I kind of break down forage scenarios, I think they fall into two, uh, really four categories um, that kind of sort themselves two ways. So the first one is what I call, this is kind of cattleman's heaven or nirvana, right? You got an abundant supply of green grass. Life's pretty easy, right? And that's where we'd all like to be. That's where we wish every summer was like in Kansas, but it doesn't work out like that, does it? We've always got something that's kind of throwing it. The second one is we've got some high quality forage, but we don't have a lot of it. So, you know, to me that brings early spring, right? Grass is greened up, we're getting ready to turn out cows, but we got forage, but it's there's just not a lot of it. Quality's pretty high, but the supply is maybe a little bit limiting in terms of what a cow can go out there and harvest. Then there's these other ones. So an abundant supply of low quality forage. This is where we tend to operate in Kansas. And Dormant native grass, corn stalks, milo stalks. Typically got a pretty good supply of it. Quality, that's eh, maybe not as high as what we'd like it to be. Then we get into this third one. It's kind of a lower fourth one, low quality forage, but a limited supply. So three of those, we've got a production response. We've got to respond as producers in some way to those different scenarios. First one's pretty easy, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about how these other situations kind of tie in tonight, a little bit about cow requirements and maybe what our supplementation strategies might need to look like to address some of these things. So really to the cow, what that forage is providing, and I break it down, these are my two big rocks. So energy and protein, okay? So we don't talk a lot about energy in a cow supplementation talk, typically. But would it surprise you if I kind of told you that energy is often more of a limitation than protein, okay? And energy is pretty important to us because that's what's gonna drive gain. If we need to put some condition on a cow, that's what's going to do it for us. One of the reasons we talk a lot about protein supplementation is what does protein do for us? If we feed the bugs in the rumen, we increase forage digestibility, their ability to break down that forage, intake goes up, so as a cow can consume more of that dormant quality grass or dormant grass, what happens to our overall energy status? It's going to go up, right? So that's where protein comes into play. So it increases intake, which increases energy availability feeds back into cow condition. So it's kind of a bit of a circle. But energy is still kind of a challenge to us in a, in a lot of these different scenarios that we'll look at. I want to ask you a question. Everybody kind of likes cars. So what do you have in your pasture? Okay. What do you really have in your pasture? Okay. So do you have a Volkswagen Beetle, kind of the cow that just gets the job done? Or do you have a Ferrari? We don't see too many Ferraris in southwest Kansas. There's probably a few of them. Okay. So Let's kind of make that cow comparison. So to me, that Volkswagen cow, today's cow herd is probably around 1,200 pounds. She produces 20 pounds of peak milk. So on her lactation curve, she's gonna produce about 20 pounds of milk. On the other end, we've got this bigger frame cow, that Ferrari, kind of the high octane cow, 
Weighs about 1,400 pounds, produces a little bit more milk at 30 pounds of peak lactation. Okay? So, what do you have? So, even if you haven't went out there and bought the most exciting genetics, but you've been buying a few, what does your seed stock producer have? Okay? Does he have some pretty high producing, high octane kind of cattle? Yeah, you cross those on the Volkswagen, what do you get? A Dodge Charger. Get a cow that's a little bit larger, she's got a little bit more horsepower under the hood, she's still got a feeder. So I would argue, some of you that think you might have some Volkswagens out there, you've probably got something that's getting a little bit closer to a Dodge Charger, just by nature of kind of, maybe you've been bringing in outside females, maybe you've been keeping replacement heifers, have they gotten a little bit larger? What's their milk production? Dr. Weber and I were talking about this milk production issue going down the road here a little bit ago. <clears throat> so what do we think peak lactation looks like in the average beef cow herd in the U.S.? Well, we think it's between 20 and 30 pounds, so we're going to kind of bracket those cows and see what that looks like. And that's a little bit of a change from what we think of in terms of what our environment can support. So let's start looking at some energy requirements. Okay, and we're going to do five series of five or six graphs, because that's really the easiest way for me to show you a lot of data all at once, is to put it all up on a graph, and then we'll bring in some forage supply here. So this is the energy requirement of those three cows. Okay, and what we're going to bring in is we're going to bring in a dormant forage base, and we're not going to supplement any protein. So this would be the energy content, and what I'd call kind of an average forage that would be maybe representative of corn stocks, milo stocks, maybe even late season dormant native range. So all these graphs are going to be the same. So the energy slides will be net energy for maintenance, mega cows per day. It's a 13 month. So we're going to go from weaning to weaning on the other end of the spectrum. You can see where we've got calving, so our peak nutrient requirements or nutrient demand is going to be about 60 days post calving. So 45 to 60 days, that's what we expect that peak. Okay. So there's my dormant forage base. Okay. I put it at 0.35 megacals per pound of energy, and I said that cow can consume about 1.8% of her body weight in that forage per day. That's not a lot. It could be higher if we put the protein supplementation back in there. We'll look at it in a minute. <clears throat> so you can see, if we had cows that are calving, on that lower quality dormant forage base, we got quite a bit of white space between what that forage can supply in terms of energy and where that cow's requirements are at. Now, as we get maybe what I'd call a traditional kind of a dry cow post weaning on the other end of the spectrum, fits that cow pretty well. Some cases early on, if we look at Milo stocks, this might be 0.45, so it'd be a little bit higher. But if we kind of take a snapshot of where we'd be now, if we were on stocks or dormant grass that's had a little bit of time to weather out there, this might be a somewhat of a representation of what's out there. So same graph, same three cows, but now we're going to look at protein requirements and supply. And we'll spend a little bit more time on this one. So it's set up the same. So what would be the crude protein content of that dormant forage base? I'll give you its multiple choice tests, okay? Three, five, or seven on a dry matter basis. Which one of those would you pick? What's that? I kind of heard five. Okay, that's what I went with, okay? So if I have a 5% crude protein forage base, and that cow consumes 2.2% of her body weight, it's going to supply about a pound and a half of crude protein to that cow per day. So that's where it's at in terms of her requirements. So you can see even there, we've got some white space between what the forage is supplying and where our cow requirements are at, especially if we would be in, oh, as we get through, let's say, into the third trimester, right in through here, it to be a pretty good gap there. Okay, so now let's put some other forages in there. So early, maybe spring green up, representative about the first 45 days. In some cases, that very early forage that's going to be out there, it can be pretty high in terms of crude protein. Wouldn't surprise me if you were to go clip some of that early spring green up for it to be 16, 17% crude protein. But what's kind of limiting? There's typically not a lot of it. So as I looked at kind of an average value of what early season was grazing would be, I kind of settled on 11% crude protein. So kind of not early spring green up, but maybe representative of the first 45 days or so is what I was trying to capture. Cows consuming a little bit more on a dry matter basis at 2.2. Some cases you might say she'd even consume about two and a half percent. So that might be go up a little bit more. <clears throat> so that green box would represent 3.4 pounds CP. Let's put a 7% forage base. So we're picture kind of going from 11 to 7 and down to 5 kind of that protein curve that we'd see on a warm season forage that's out there. So you can see where that kind of falls out too. So 
most of us are going to feed some sort of a protein supplement, right, to fill some of this gap that's up here on the front side, especially maybe during that third trimester, right? So let's put that in there. There's four pounds of a 20% supplement, so a 20% range key. Now, in some cases, the other thing you can do is maybe you calve a little bit different time relative to where I've seen it. This is kind of the ideal situation where you're calving right as we kind of overlay that calving season with early spring green up on those forages. So if you kind of shift all the boxes that way, you'd have a little bit more of a gap in your protein, so you'd take a little bit more protein supplement. So I kind of thought I'd throw that in there as well. Say what happens if we go to six pounds to cover that gap, okay? Is there a cow in there where there still might be a gap, especially if we shifted that calving season over in terms of protein, even at six pounds of a 20, which is a fair bit of supplement, right? That high octane, 1,400-pound, 30-pound peak lactation cow, there might still be a gap there. Really hinges on what that cow's intake looks like, right? So now let's start to combine them a little bit. So we'll switch back to energy, so required versus supply. Now we're going to put that protein supplement in there. So that lighter brown is that same base forage from before. We've put a little protein in there. Now our intake goes from 1.8 to 2.2. We covered a lot more of that cow's requirements, especially as we get out in, into these areas too. So we gained roughly 10% in there by just increasing that. So now we're going to put what well, we kind of got our increase in intake, do the protein supplementation. We're going to put our green forage in there, so our 0.35. If we go to green forage and the energy within it, Basically, what I did was I doubled it. I said it's going to go to 0.65. Clicked it in a little bit fast for you there. That's going to be about 21 megacals coming into the system. So just maybe covers that higher octane cow, that 1,430-pound peak lactation cow that's out there. Do I still have a little bit of white space possibly in terms of my energy requirement versus supply? Yeah, right in through there, right? So are we deficient in protein or energy? We can meet our protein needs with a little bit of supplement, but even with those increases, we've still got a little bit of a gap here, okay? So, talked about mentally kind of shifting these boxes to where your calving is, so that's what we're gonna do here. What if I calve a little bit earlier? Now that little bit of a white gap in terms of my energy deficit turned into a much bigger gap, okay? So let's spend a little bit of time with this one. So if we take, this 1,420 pound cow it kind of represents the middle of the road there. So her requirement's going to be about 17 megacals per day. That dormant forage base is required about 11. So I've got a five to six megacal deficit in terms of her energy requirement versus supply. Okay? What's that translate into? Let's say we got five megacals. Okay? We do it on a monthly basis, so five times 30. This is cowboy math. So 150 megacals, okay? So what does that 150 megacals really look like? Well, corn has one megacal per pound of energy. So that's the energy that would be contained within 150 pounds of corn, okay? Now let's put it in terms of cow body condition score, okay? On an energy basis, one cow body condition score, so moving from a five to a six, is roughly about 200 megacals of energy, okay? How many megacals do they say in a 30, days, would that cow be deficient? 150. So we've got somewhere between a half and three quarters of a condition score that that cow is going to lose or potentially mobilize her body reserves to meet that need. What's that look like in terms of a pound per day basis? Well, if body condition score is close to 90 pounds on a 1,400 pound beef cow, so that's a fair, is that a positive plane in nutrition or a negative plane in nutrition? It's kind of going like that, right? <clears throat> so we can easily see how energy might be getting us into trouble in a few of these situations, especially if we happen to be a person who's maybe calving a little bit earlier. And Sandy talked about that's not a perfect system either, right? Because when are you breeding those cows? During the heat of the summer. So this is kind of my, we've recognized the problem, right? We can see where our forage is supplying and, and kind of what's out there today. So I started to ask myself the question, well, how much of a reduction in available forage supply does it take before I fall below these cows' requirements? Okay. 
And what I settled on was about a 20% reduction. And so here's what that looks like. Instead of being 2.2% of that cow's body weight, I modeled it as about 1.75. So when we reduce that, now we're short quite a bit. We don't cover ourselves, especially as we get into that peak lactation point where that cow might be at. And we still got the same deficits that we were talking about earlier. So let's talk about maybe some take home points from those six graphs, okay? One of the things I take away from it is, so we probably do have some higher producing cows that might be out there in a cow herd. Is if you look at the, what our forage can supply, the nutrient requirements of those cows relative to what our forage supply under ideal conditions, they match pretty well, okay? When we get into those less than ideal situations, like a 20% reduction in forage availability, which isn't a lot, I think a lot of times we get in a, dry, in a drought situation out west especially, it's far worse than just 20%. It might be as much as a 30 or even a 50%. So forage availability is kind of the key in terms of both energy and protein. Okay, We don't think about this energy deal on the cow side of things near as much as we do in other things. So let's think about this scenario where we have a high quality forage, let's say wheat pasture. Okay. What happens if we restrict intake? What's calf gain or steer gain look like on calves that are grazing short wheat? Is it very good? Typically, as the wheat gets shorter, what's calf gain do? Goes down, okay? So think about that scenario in terms of where we put our cows, especially on early spring green up and what that could do and where the limitations might be for us. So here's the infamous handout that I seem to left at our, at our last stop, okay? So this kind of gets into the production response. And what I'll do for you guys is I will share it with Alicia. We'll spend a little bit more time walking through this this evening than what I, what I normally would. But I'll get it to Alicia, I'll get it to Jared, and you guys, I'll even give you my email address at the end. So part of this production response is, are you going out there and looking for the right supplement? I think in a lot of times, as producers, one of the things that we tend to do is we do kind of what we've always done, regardless of whether it fits. Right? Kind of the square peg in a round hole. You just get a bigger hammer, right? And keep on driving. Or that's what I've always done. What I really like about this flow chart, if you will, <clears throat> and it came from my time at New Mexico State, is it kind of breaks this complex issue of energy, protein, and forage supply, and how to go find the right supplement down into really kind of three basic questions. Okay? The first one of these questions kind of gets at forage availability. It says a cow have all she wants to, to eat in the pasture each and every day. Okay? The second question it asks is, what color is the forage? Why is that important? So what's the crude protein content of brown forage? Typically around 5%, right? What's the protein content of green forage? Typically something greater than 7, which would be kind of our cutoff for a protein supplementation. The third question is, do you need to put condition on the cows? Or do you main, need to maintain the condition that you have? So are we trying to gain condition or we need to put more energy in the system? So let's kind of look at what I'd call maybe that cow nirvana. And, and uh, so does a cow have all she wants to, to eat in the pasture each and every day? The answer to that is yes. Okay, and she's got green forage. What do we need to do? Well, not much. Protein is good, energy is good. However, she's got plenty of forage but it's brown, okay? Protein is likely less than 7% and limiting forage intake and digestion. So what do we need to shop for? Maybe a protein supplement if the cows are in good shape. So if the cows are in good shape, we supplement with a high protein supplement, 0.1 to 0.3% of body weight. You guys can kind of read, trying to drive it. If I need to put gain on some cows, do I need protein or energy? What drives gain? Energy, right? So if I need to gain, supplement with a little lower crude protein content, improve our room efficiency, and maybe provide a little bit of extra energy. All right, so let's kind of go the other side of this. So we're a little short on grass, but it's green. Now what am I deficient in? Do I need protein? Not typically, I need a little bit of energy, okay? So let's say I don't have a lot of forage, it's brown. What do I need to do there? Supplement with some protein. But is, it, is energy deficient as well? Yeah. So for me, supplements fall into kind of three categories. 
We've got protein supplements. That's kind of what we do normally. We've got energy supplements. Okay. Then we've got combination supplements. We do have some scenarios where we need both energy and protein. So that brown forage where I don't have a lot of it, okay, that's a situation where I know protein's limiting, and because of the reduction in forage availability, I also need to bring a little bit of energy into the system. So not something we talk about. The good part for us here in Kansas, though, in terms of our supplements, we have several things out there, products out there that we can feed. We do a pretty good job. So byproducts. What's the crude protein content of distiller's grains? About 30, 30, 31. What's the energy content? 0.95 to 0.97. Kind of depends on what it's made of and who you want to ask. But it's pretty high. Corn's one mega cal. It's got 95, 97% the energy that corn would have. And it's high fiber. So that's a pretty good combination supplement. Okay. So we've got some products out there that do fit that scenario that we may find ourselves in. So I think one of the things that, you know, as you kind of look at that graph and is I think it's really important to recognize where you're at. What do you really need? What does that cow need? What are you deficient in? And then adjust that supplementation strategy to maybe fit that cow a little bit better. I think body condition scoring is a big part of that. So if you don't body condition score your cows, it's something to certainly think about. That's the best tool we have in terms of being able to gauge what a group of cows, where they're really at. If you take a set of cows at weaning and they're thin, when's the best time to put a little weight back on those cows? Right then, their requirements are pretty low. So for every pound of supplemental feed you put out them, it's going to go back to the cow. As you move later, what happens? Especially in a spring calving scenario. Cows get a little further along in the gestation curve, so our requirements are going up. But we're also starting to deal with cold, right? <clears throat> The other thing that's super critical is maximizing use of the forage base. You know, can that cow eat all she wants to each and every day? What's driving the intake? And so the other part of it is trying to throw some strategies at you guys in terms of, well, what can we do about it? And so one of the other things that I think is, how many of you have different qualities of forages available to you? Even in your hay yard. Some of you probably have some low quality grass hay. Maybe you've got a little bit of alfalfa. Do you strategically use that hay? and time it to win those cows to match those cows requirements or do you just kind of well I think I need a little protein you know these cows so I'm gonna roll them out a little bit of alfalfa I think they're a little shorter where they're at what if we kinda what if that lower quality grass hay would really meet that need what if it's a reduction in forage availability with a little bit of protein supplementation in a more concentrated form we might be able to deliver that and accomplish the same goal the other thing in terms of supplementation that I kinda start to think about we got a lot of people that want to feed hay well, hay is a great supplement, but what happens with, with hay? A pound of hay replaces a pound of what? Grazed forage a lot of times. So it's kind of max, it's kind of you're meeting the need, but we're also giving a little bit on this other side in terms of substitution there. What a more concentrated form of either energy or protein maybe get us drive a little bit more of utilizing that forage base that we're operating on. Okay? Something to think about there. So do any of you use rumensin? in your cow herd programs. Couple? So I think we're what at maybe twenty percent tonight. So that's about we kind of have a running poll of audiences. So we like to ask this remensing question just to see how many so widely, widely used in the feedlot industry. I'm gonna say probably somewhere eighty five, ninety percent of the cattle on feed in the US receives some type of ionophore. And it might even be higher. That's just my windshield survey of what that number probably looks like widely widely used technology in the feeding industry there is a label approval to utilize this product on the cow side in a mature reproducing beef cow but the last survey we did where we actually recorded the results it was about 30 percent of beef producers in the state of kansas actually use this technology we talk a lot about it when it's dry but i think there's an opportunity if you're feeding a cow a pound of dry supplement to utilize this product what's it do for us what's it do in the feedlot sector improves feed efficiency so think increased cow gain on the same resources or better body condition scores on cows on the same forage base. Somewhere the magnitude of five to ten percent is the number we'd put on it. Okay. So in terms of the cost, probably two to three cents per head per day. The downside of it is 
If you're putting it in, say you've got a commodity blend, DDGs and maybe something else that you're blending and feeding to a cows, you're probably going to have to run that product through some sort of feed mill to put it in there. That's where the cost is going to come at, because you're probably looking at a mixing charge with whatever that might be of 10 to 12 bucks a ton. You can get it in some products that you can add on farm, but that's not for everybody, because you've got to have a scale, you've got to be able to mix it, um, <clears throat> and you've got to be able to read the label. 200 milligrams per head per day is, is kind of where that's at. There is a response at the lower levels. But we, so we've got a label and some restrictions that we've got to work with, with inside that. But something to consider if you're not doing that, especially if you maybe have some cows that you struggle to keep condition on through the winter months. So, the other thing, can we manage cow requirements? Is there anything we can do about it? We just kind of talked about that, hey, we may have some increased lactation potential in these cows, but what can we do about it? So this graph here kind of represents one of my light bulb moments from a few years ago. Okay? I don't know why I was preparing for a talk and I thought, I'm going to put cow requirements on an annual basis. I'm going to look at the caloric needs of a cow and I'm going to put it in a pie chart. And I'm going to kind of break it out in terms of how we manage cows. So to me, we have dry cows, I have third trimester cows, and I have a cow with a calf. Okay? And what jumped out at me, and I don't know why, okay, but it just kind of, this is where the light bulb went up. So 60% of the calories that we put into a beef cow are in the form of lactation. So 60% of our calories that we spend is in that cow producing milk to support that calf. Makes sense. That's what she's supposed to do, right? Okay. So, you know, we talk, have a lot of discussions about mature body weight. You know, we're going, maybe going up from 1,200 to 1,400 or maybe even if you go further back from 1,000-pound cows going to a 1,400-pound cow. But when I look at this, a small change in lactation potential, maybe going from 20 to 25, because it's 60% of our calories, that's a big change, possibly. Okay? So there's 9,999 megacals on an annual basis. Okay? So if I have that increased lactation potential, how can I manage that? Well, shorten it. We have a great tool in the form of early weaning. I've been several studies done in Hayes to kind of tell you how well it works. So this is that same 1,400 pound cow. This is 20 pounds of peak lactation. And instead of having that calf at side for 180 days, I cut it off at 120 days. And we need a 120 day old calf. Okay? So my greatest requirements are early on in lactation. So it's, it's not as many calories as you would think. If it goes from 56 to 54% on a total caloric basis, but when we look at the total calories that we might be saving, we go from 9,099, so think 9,100, to 8,765. That's 300 and over 300 megacals. So how many megacals are in a pound of corn? One. 300, pound of cow, 300 pounds of corn is what that energy would represent. What's that in terms of body condition score? at least a condition score, almost probably one and a half to two condition scores we could save by weaning that calf a little bit earlier. So one of the other things we don't talk maybe as much about is maybe if we do have a little more production in some females than maybe what that environment can sustain, this might be a great tool for us to be able to manage some of that, especially if we talk about it in a dry year, might be something to consider maybe every year. If you find yourself in that scenario where you feel like you're playing catch up all the time. So just kind of an interesting observation on my part, maybe stimulating a little bit of discussion with you guys later. Okay. So here's the last thing I want to leave you with. And this is maybe something to think about. We talked about that small reduction in forage supply. Okay. And what does that look like? So in April, May of 2018, when you were considering turning out cows, how did you respond to that scenario? Okay. Did you turn out the same number of cows, thinking that you were going to graze them for however long you could and then take them up? Or did you turn out fewer cows to match the forage resources that you had? And there's not a right or a wrong answer. Just think about how you responded a little bit to that. Okay? I don't think either one's right or wrong, but it kind of says which ways, which one's kind of driving the bus a little bit, and how did you respond to it? So. So, if you would like to have that handout, okay, in blue is my email address. So, jwagon at ksu.edu. I'm blessed with a rather long last name, so it wouldn't all fit. 
and that was the coolest thing they could give me. The other options weren't near as exciting as that one, and that one's not all that exciting. So at K-State, I became Jay Wagon. So send me an email at jwagon at ksu.edu or talk with Alicia or Jared, and I will make sure you get that because that is a handy tool when, you, when we get in different scenarios because a lot of times I see folks throw a lot of protein at a scenario where actually they really need some protein and some additional energy. It's pretty easy to just kick out a few more pounds of a 20% range cube when we could use some other things like DDGs or even corn in some scenarios to meet that need. So, Dr. Weber, I think we'll move on to our third part. So, get everybody home before it gets too dark and too cold. 